What's up everyone? Today I'm solving the parallel letter frequency problem in Exorcism's Elixir track. I've already loaded everything up into VS Code so we can jump straight in and solve the problem. What this function needs to do is take a list of strings and count up the frequency of the letters inside all those strings. So the first thing I'm going to do is extract all graphemes. So this is a dummy function that I haven't implemented yet, but what I'd like it to do is to take this list of strings and return to me a list of all the individual characters. So it would be something like, uh, the first one would be A, the next one would be B, the next one would be space based on these strings here, and so on and so on until we finish all of the texts in here. So that's what that function is going to do. The next function is going to accept all of those graphemes and then just count the letters, all right? Let's start fleshing out both of those functions. So I'll do def p and I'll do extract all graphemes. And what that's going to accept is the list of texts. And for the dummy function, I'm just going to return the list of texts. Next thing I'll do is flesh out this count letters function. So count letters is going to accept a list of graphemes that comes out of the extract all graphemes function. And what it will do in the beginning is just return the graphemes. But in the end, it will return a map like this that has counted up all the letters. What I'll do now is jump into IEX so we can start building this out. To do that, I'll jump over to the test file, copy this code.load file thing in here jump down into the console and load the, the frequency function, frequency module, sorry, and I'll run frequency.frequency. .frequency. What we'll do is copy down this test string here just to make sure that it operates the way that we expect. I'll jump down, I'll paste that in, and we'll pass in a worker's argument of one. We're not doing any concurrency, so this doesn't matter, the number that we pass in here, but I'll just pass one in to begin with. And we can see here that all this is doing is just passing text through all of these functions and we're just getting exactly what we passed in at the beginning. Let's start implementing extract all graphemes. The way that I'm going to get all of the individual characters out of the texts is to first join them up. So I'm going to do that with enum.join. I'll join them up and then I'll try and extract all of the individual characters with another function. If I do enum.join, let me reload the code here and run that function again and you'll see what happens is that what we do is we take each one of these strings in here and we join it together with just an empty string. If I added another string at the end here, if I added another thing, let's say I added D, it would just add D to the end. So now we have a single string, and the way that I'll extract all of the individual characters from that is to pass it to string.graphemes. And what string.graphemes is going to do is just return a list of all the individual characters. I'll reload the code and run it again on that. You can see here that we have all of the individual characters that we've passed in here. So we've passed in three texts, but now what we get out is a list of all the individual characters in all of those texts. So that function's done. That's all I wanted it to do was just to accept a list of texts and get all of the graphemes out of it. So that's good, that one's done. The next thing we need to do is to count the letters in this, this list of graphemes. I know that the way that I wanna count all the letters is with enum.reduce. So I reach for enum.reduce anytime that I'm accepting a list and I'm processing it in some way that results in a list of a different length or a data structure of a different kind. So in this case, we're taking a list and we'd like to return a map and that way I know that I'm going to need something like enum.reduce. So the enumerable that I'm going to enumerate over is graphemes, and the initial accumulator will be a map. So it's just gonna be an empty map. And the function, the function is going to accept an individual grapheme, uh, an individual grapheme and the accumulator. So that's what we've got there. What we need to do now is to flesh out the way that enum.reduce is going to count just the letters in here. So the first item that's going to get passed in is A, the second item that gets passed in is going to be B, then space, and what I need to do here is decide whether or not one of these is a letter or not. If it is a letter, so what I'll do is I'll flesh this out in comments. So I'll say if grapheme is a letter, then what I want to do is downcase the letter because I want it to be case insensitive. I want to downcase the letter, then increment the count of letter in the accumulator. Else, what I wanna do is do nothing, right? I just wanna do nothing, which in enum.reduce basically just means return the accumulator. Okay, so this is the, the meat of the function. I need to determine whether or not this individual grapheme, which is going to be one of these strings down here, is or isn't a letter. I'll open up a, another IEX terminal here to show you what we can use. So one thing that we could use is string.match. So what string.match accepts is a string and then a regular expression. So if you were checking whether or not something was a letter, 
the most common thing that you might use is this sigil R, which is for a regular expression. And what would be matching is A to Z. And since we want this to be case insensitive, I'll pass the I option. So this works for A, right? This is going to tell us that A is a letter. If we pass in capital A, since we've got the I, the case insensitive option, that's also going to be true. And if we pass in something like the equal sign, for instance, that's going to be false because it's not a letter, right? The problem with this is that I've already had a quick look at the tests and I can see that one of the things that the tests are going to throw at us is this text here, which has some non-English letters. I don't know if you can see it, but there's a an O with an umlaut in here and another one. So there are two O's with umlauts and there are also two U's with umlauts from the German language. And if we pass this into our string dot match here with the regular expression, so if I replace equals here with that O with the umlaut, that's going to return false because O with an umlaut isn't in that range of A to Z. So this A to Z range is not going to work for us to determine whether or not something's a letter. Luckily with Elixir, we have the we, we can do string dot match with a regular expression that has this U option turned on. What the U option is, is a, a Unicode match. So if I run over to the Elixir regular expression module, if we scroll down to the modifiers Unicode here, so this is what we're using, the Unicode U modifier, which allows us to use a pattern like backslash P, and the backslash P pattern is actually what we want. So if I jump back down in here, what I'll do is I'm going to match the start of the string and the end of the string just to confirm that it's a single character. Then I'm going to do backslash P, open curly braces, L, and close curly braces. What all of these characters together mean, this uh, backslash P, open curly braces, L, close curly braces, is a single character in the Unicode category of letter. So what that's going to do is it's going to match a letter in any language. So if I run this command now, this is going to return true, which is what we want. Let's confirm that it still works on our, our previous ones with a single lowercase a. This should also work on an uppercase a. Note that we don't have the i, the case insensitive option, but that's still going to work for uppercase a. So this Unicode match is really, really powerful. And what it'll actually allow you to do is match, um, let's say Chinese as well. So if I do the character for you there in Chinese, that's also going to match because Unicode recognizes this as a character. And before you think that this will just match anything we pass to it, if I pass in the equal sign as before, that's going to return false, right? Because it's not a letter. If I do something that looks like a letter, like the dollar sign, that's also going to be false. So this string dot match is exactly what we want to determine whether or not a character is a letter. Now I'll jump back over to our code and I'll replace this if grapheme is a letter. What I'll do is I'll, I'll say if string dot match and then instead of the, <clears throat> excuse me, this O with an umlaut, I'm going to say the grapheme, <clears throat> excuse me. Then what we're going to do is downcase the letter. Else, what we want to do is do nothing. So what we'll do here is just return the accumulator and close that if statement. So now all I need to do is to downcase the letter and increment the count of letter in the accumulator. So downcase the letter, what I'll say is downcased downcase letter is equal to string dot downcase. And that's going to be the grapheme that we downcase and we don't need that mode. So the way string dot downcase works, if you're not familiar, is it just returns the lowercase version of the string. So if I downcase the capital letter A, I get the lowercase A. Now all I need to do is increment the count of letter in, a, in the accumulator and I'll do that with map.update. Map.update, I'll pass in the accumulator. The key that I'm going to update is the downcase letter. Initially, if that downcase letter isn't in the map, I'm going to set the value to one. And then finally, I'll supply a function if there's already a count in there. What I'll do is increment that count by one. All right, so I think that's everything. So we have our texts, we're extracting all the graphemes, and then what we're doing is we're counting up only the letters. We're downcasing the letter and incrementing, incrementing the count of the, the letter in a map by one. Let's jump back over into IEX. I'm gonna close that one on the right and I'll reload the code. And now I'll run that function down there, frequency.frequency .frequency on our string there. And we're getting back what we expect. We've got A2, B2, C2, and D1 because we've got that extra D string in there. I think that this non-concurrent code that I've got here is reasonable to pass the test. So what I'll do is I'll quit out of IX here and run all the tests against this code. All right, so I've uncommented all the, the, the tests already and I can see that my code, my implementation at the moment is passing all the tests. We have nine tests and zero failures. This implementation, non-concurrent, but is working and passing all the tests.
Now that all the tests are passing with the non-concurrent code, I'm going to start doing the concurrent implementation and make sure that all the tests continue to pass. What I've done at the top is convert our original implementation to run any time that workers is equal to one. So if we pass in a worker argument of one, it's going to call our original non-concurrent implementation. And I've created a new clause down here that's going to get called any time workers is greater than one. And this is going to be our concurrent code. The way that I'm going to add concurrency to this calculation is by using a function called async stream with an arity of five, and that's on the task module, right? The task module has a whole bunch of functions that allow you to do asynchronous and concurrent code pretty easily in Elixir. This function I think is the best one. It says, returns a stream that runs the given module, function, and arguments concurrently on each item in enumerable. What that basically means is that the number of items in enumerable is going to determine the number of workers that async stream is going to spin up. And for each worker that async stream spins up, it's going to pass an item to that worker and apply the module function and arguments to it. So since I know that I'm going to be implementing that, I've got a little diagram that shows the way that that's going to be done. At the top here, I've got a list of graphemes. So this is what we get out of our extractor graphemes function. And what I'd like to do is to calculate the letter frequency here with a number of workers. So imagine that I want to do that with two workers. I'm going to have a split into chunks function that splits our original list of graphemes into a certain number of chunks. Here I've split into two chunks, AB and then another chunk of CD. This is what's going to get passed to task.asyncstream5. And it's going to spin up a worker for each one of those chunks. So worker one gets A and B, worker two gets C and D. They both calculate their letter frequencies independently in parallel and then return OK, and then the results that come back from that worker. All we need to do at that point is to merge the results. So these two individual maps need to be merged into a single map. So let's see how we do this in Elixir. Since I know that I'm going to be starting with the list of all graphemes, I'll start with texts and pass it into extract all graphemes. And now what I'd like to do is to pass this into another function called split into chunks. And what that's going to do is split it up into the number of chunks equal to the number of workers that we want. Next, we pass this to task.asyncstream5. And the module that we're going to choose the function from is this module. See, I want to call this count letters function down here. So the module is going to be the current module. So I've done underscore, underscore, module, underscore, underscore, which is a shortcut to the current module. The function name is going to be count letters. Now I need to stop here and show you that if we're using task.asyncstream5, the function that we give to that has to be a public function. So all I'm going to do is just remove this p at the end of def p to convert this into a public function. The arguments are going to be empty, so that's fine, and I don't need any options. Lastly, what we need to do is to merge the results. And it's going to be a stream, so I'm going to say merge results stream, and we don't need any extra arguments in there. Let's start fleshing out the dummy versions of those functions. So I've got split, split into chunks, and that's going to get all the graphemes and the number of chunks that we want to split it into. At first, I'll just return one chunk. So I'll just return all graphemes in a list. And then finally, we need this merge results stream function. And what that's going to get is the results stream from all of the workers. And since it's a stream, I just want to convert it into a list originally. And eventually, it's going to be converted into a map. But first, I'll just do enum.toList, and it's going to convert that results stream into a list. All right, so with this, I can start to play around and start implementing this. I'll jump over into IEX and load up the code. What I'll do is load up the code here and I'll call frequency dot frequency. And originally what I'll do is I'll just pass in ABCD as a single text, close that, and I'll just call our original, original implementation with one worker. So I can see here that we get back exactly what we expect, a map of A1, B1, C1, D1. If I call this with two workers, this should now call our second implementation, our concurrent implementation, and we'll see what we get back. Awesome, so what I've got here is just an okay, and then the same result. So this is calling it with just a single worker. Since we're not splitting it into chunks, we're just returning a single chunk, we have called task.asyncstream, and we've got the result back from the worker, which is okay, and then the result from the worker. So that's great, all we need to do now is implement this split into chunks function and see what comes out then. So what I'll do is I know that the way that I'll split things into chunks is with enum dot uh, chunk every. So chunk every needs an enumerable, which is going to be all graphemes. And then next it's going to be the count, not of the number of chunks, but the number of items in each chunk. So what we need is graphemes per chunk. 
and this isn't a variable that we have yet, so I'll just start implementing that up here. So we've got graphemes per chunk. And what that's going to be is the total number of graphemes that we have divided by the number of chunks that we want. So what I need to do here is get the length or the count. So I'll say all graphemes count, and I'll do enum.count, enum and I'll count all graphemes. And then what I'll do is I'll divide that all graphemes count by the number of chunks. So number number of chunks. And that's going to give us the graphemes per chunk. But since we're dividing something that could be um, an odd number and could also be zero actually, we need to make sure that we round this up. And first thing I'll do is handle that case when it's zero. So this is going to fail if it's zero because we're gonna end up passing a graphemes per chunk of zero to chunk every and that's gonna fail. The way that I'll handle this is I'll just create a new uh, definition here of the frequency function that works anytime that we have no texts. Anytime we have the empty text, and it doesn't matter the number of workers we've got, what we're going to do is just return the empty map. So that's fine. So that's handled the case where all graphemes count is uh, zero because it won't ever get called. We'll call that default version of the function. But this could be odd, which means that graphemes per chunk could be a float. So the way that I'm going to handle that is with erlang.seal. And what this is going to do is it's going to round it up and turn it into an integer. The reason that we want to round it up is that if we round it down, we could be excluding items um, from chunks with chunk every. So we need to round it up and we need to make sure that it's an integer because chunk every expects an integer. This looks complete to me. I'll jump back into IEX and reload the code and we'll run this again with our uh, workers equal to two. And now I can see that I've split this into chunks and we have the results from each worker. So this is actually now run with two workers. We have concurrent code running. So we've got OK, A1, B1 for the first worker, OK, C1, D1 for the second worker, exactly like our diagram says. We can also split this into four workers. You can see we have OK, A1, OK, B2, uh, B1, OK, C1, OK, D1. So this split into chunks is working as expected. And all I need to do now is merge all of those results. And I need to be careful here because let's say that I change this string to include some A, B, C, D again. And I'll split this into two chunks just so you can see what's happening. Now we have two chunks of A1, B1, C1, and D1. And we don't want to merge these and just override them with the values in the second map. We wanna actually add those two together. So that's just something that I need to be careful of when I'm uh, enumerating over the results and merging them together. All right, let's start implementing this merge result stream function. Now I know that since it's going to be a list of results and I want to turn this into a map, I'm going to use enum.reduce again. And the enumerable is going to be the results stream. The accumulator is going to start out as an empty map and the function is going to receive as the first argument, it's going to receive okay and the worker, worker result. As the second argument, it's going to be the accumulator. And now we've got that. The way that we're going to build up the accumulator is by doing a map.merge. And what we need to merge is the accumulator and the worker result. Now we need to be careful here because if we use map.merge like this, it's going to override whatever's in accumulator with the worker result. So if you have the same key, right? If we have A1 in the accumulator already and we merge it with the second one, it's just going to override it. But what we wanna do is add it together and I can use the arity of three version of this function. So I'm going to pass a function that determines what happens when we already have a key in the accumulator and the worker result. So the key, and then we'll have the accumulator value and the worker value. And what needs to happen is that they need to be added together. So the accumulator value is going to be added with the worker value, and that's going to give our final result. This looks fine to me. So I think that we should be complete. I'm gonna jump back into IEX and check that out. So I'll reload the code and let's run this. Awesome, so this is working as expected. The frequency of A is two, B2, C2, and D2. Let's run this with our single worker to show what our original implementation would have given. And the results are exactly the same. So the concurrent code looks like it's done. I'm gonna run the tests again to make sure that we're actually passing all the tests with our concurrent code. If I run that, awesome. So if I jump to the tests, I can see that the last test in the file there is actually going to be testing with four workers and the results are correct. So now we've got a, a single threaded implementation and a concurrent implementation that are both passing the tests. What I wanna do now is actually benchmark our new concurrent code to make sure that it's any faster than our original single threaded implementation.
Let's go ahead and compare the performance of our original non-concurrent implementation with our new concurrent implementation. The question I'm trying to answer here is, did adding all of this extra complexity to our code actually make it run any faster? The way that I'll answer that question is by using an Elixir benchmarking package called Benchy. Benchy is going to take a number of functions and give us some nice printed results about which one's faster. What I'll do is go down here and copy this mix dependency. And what I'll do in here is create a new mix project so we can actually test this. I'll run mix, new, and then frequency. It's going to create a new mix project in here in the frequency directory. I'll open the mix.exs and paste in our Benchy dependency. Back down in the terminal, I'll change directory into frequency and then run mix depth.get to pull in the dependencies. Now that's finished running, what I'd like to do is to copy over our exorcism code, this exorcism module, and paste it into our mix project. So I'll just go into lib frequency.ex and just paste that entire thing in there. All that's left to do now is to create a benchmarking script. In the root directory of the mix project, I'll create a new file called benchmark.exs. It's going to be an Elixir script. In here, I'll run benchy.run and give Benchy a map of things to compare. What I'd like to compare is the original code. And first off, I'll give that a zero arity anonymous function with frequency dot frequency. And it's going to take a variable called texts, which I haven't created yet, but the number of workers is going to be one. So when workers is equal to one, we know that we're going to be calling our original non-concurrent implementation. And what I'll do now is I'll just paste that a few times and add some options for our concurrent code. So in here, I'd like to test the concurrent code with two workers. And so I'll change the workers to two. And I'll also run this with four workers, change this to four. And finally, I'd like to run this with eight workers as well. And I'll change this to eight. So we've got our spec here. Now all I need to do is to create this text variable. So to create texts, what I'm gonna start with is a single text variable. And this is going to be the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. And what I'd like to do is multiply this a certain number of times, depending on how difficult I'd like this letter frequency calculation to be. So text is going to be list.duplicate, and it's going to duplicate text a certain number of times. So this is going to be another variable that I haven't implemented yet called duplicates. And the way this works, I'll jump into IEX down here and show you how list.duplicate works. So if I run list.duplicate, and we'll do hello, comma, and then three. It's going to duplicate hello three times and return a list. So this is a really nice and convenient way for us to control the difficulty of this to see if the difficulty of the workload actually changes the efficiency of running it concurrently or the original code. So for duplicates, I'll create that up here. Duplicates, this variable. What I'd like to do is get this from the command line. So when I run mix run benchmark.exs, I'd like to be able to pass in one or 10 or 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 and have that affect the difficulty inside the actual script. So for duplicates, the way that I'm going to do that is with system.argv and that's going to return the arguments that we add to the command line call. I'm going to take the first one, sorry, list.first to get the first item in that list. And then what I'll do is just do string.to integer to convert that string into an integer. Now, I'm not concerned about the fact that this will fail if I pass in a non-integer string, but you know, since I'm the only one calling it, we can just leave it like this. So this is complete now. What I'd like to do is actually call this with Benchy and see what the results are. Let's go ahead and run the benchmark with duplicates is equal to one. What this is going to do is do the lowest level workload possible based on this text. It's just going to duplicate it one time and then calculate the letter frequency with our original code and then with two, four, and eight workers. Down here in the output, you can see that Benchy's output some diagnostic information. And what it will do is benchmark each one of these functions for five seconds with a two second warm up. You can see down here the output of it benching all of our different functions, two workers, four workers, eight workers, and now it's doing the original code. And once it's done, you'll be able to see the results. So the results here are sorted by speed. So in this case, our original code is actually the fastest. This IPS here is the iterations per second. So the number of times per second that we were able to calculate the letter frequency based on this string with the original code. And it's significantly faster. Down here in the comparison, you can see how much faster than our concurrent code it is. The original code is one. And with two workers, we're over two times slower. Four workers is over two and a half times slower. And with eight workers, it's over three times slower than our original code. 
So what this demonstrates is that for a really easy workload like this, if this was what your application was doing, all of that extra complexity that you added in for the concurrency has not only made your code slower, but it's made it more complex. So that's a really interesting result with one duplicate. What I'll do now is I'll run it with 100 duplicates to see if the results are any different. We'll come back once that's finished running. So the benchmark for duplicates is equal to 100 has finished running now, and the results are really pretty amazing. So in the previous one, the original code was the fastest, and now we've got eight workers being the fastest one here. So the iterations per second there was 182, and we can see down in the comparison that the original code now is around 14% slower than eight workers. Uh, eight workers and four workers are about the same. So in Benchy, if you have anything less than 10%, you can say that they're basically performing um, at the same rate. And two workers is slightly slower than four workers. So this is really interesting. And this demonstrates that as we increase the number of texts that we're passing in, that actually concurrency starts to perform better. And the reason is, if we jump back over to our code, you can see that it's actually doing quite a lot in here. So we're splitting it into chunks, we're creating a new process to actually compute the different values for each chunk, and then we're merging the results. So when we had the very, very small string, this was a really significant portion of the calculation. As we make the calculation that's happened, well, that happens inside each worker, as we make that more difficult and make that take longer, it's changed the proportion. So even though we add all this overhead, because we can compute it quicker inside the worker, that's starting to produce a good result. Based on what we've got down here, the difference between 5.49 milliseconds and 6.28 milliseconds, 14%, I mean, it's really much of a muchness. I would say that probably if your workload was equal to duplicates is equal to 100, that even still, I would not go towards the concurrent code simply because of all the extra complexity that it adds to your code and potential fragility. So if any of the failures occur in any of the workers or anything like that, you're basically adding fragility to your code for not really that much performance. What I'll do now is I'll run it with 1000 and see if that makes any difference as well. The benchmark for duplicates is equal to 1000 has finished running now and you can see that the order of the results is basically the same. So we've got eight workers on top still and uh, this time it's taken a, a significantly longer time to run the function. So we've got 43 milliseconds there for eight workers and the original code completes it in 70 milliseconds with four and two workers in between. So you can see here in the comparison that the eight workers is around 63% faster than the original code. So fairly significant. Now that we've jumped up to a more difficult workload, we're starting to see that eight workers is really pulling, pulling in front. So what we've saved here is about 30 milliseconds off the, the time that it takes to run. So if your workload is about this level, I mean, it may make sense to use the concurrent code. Obviously you're not getting eight times better performance, but if you can remove about 50% of your time to compute a result, that could actually mean the difference between something being usable and unusable. The last thing I'll run here is I'll run it with 10,000 just to see if there's any additional gains that we get by increasing the duplicates even further. And our final benchmark with duplicates is equal to 10,000 has completed now. The order of the list has stayed the same, but we've sort of maxed out in the improvements. So eight workers is around 70% faster in duplicates is equal to 10,000. Still not even a multiple of two faster, so it's not twice as fast. You can see that the difference here in time between eight workers and the original code is around 300 full milliseconds. So eight workers did it in 414, original code 714. Pretty significant. I don't know if this workload is particularly unrealistic, but I would say that probably if you're pushing it this hard on the CPU, you may want to be calling out to something like C++. But this is an interesting result nonetheless. And yeah, concurrency wins when the workload is this difficult. Mm -hmm.